Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this seventh Sunday after Epiphany. I don't usually get this long in Epiphany. We get to seven Sundays. So that means that we are soon starting Lent. Lent will begin on March 2nd with Ash Wednesday services here at Norwich Lutheran, and then we will rotate back and forth with First Lutheran throughout the season of Lent. Um, so if we start with Ash Wednesday, that also means that come Easter Sunday, we are sunrise service here. In our prayers this week, Scott Evans, who's having some back trouble, um, and Larry Hillrood, who's Ardell Hillrood's son, um, who's battling complications from COVID. The First Lutheran Church Council meeting will be on Wednesday at 7. On Thursday on 2 o'clock is the Gather Bible Study for First Lutheran. And like I said last week, and I think most of you heard this, um, we were going to have an um, early out activity event at First Lutheran that um, first Wednesday in March, um, but that is now being used for a snow day. So hopefully we'll be able to do that when they have the early out in April. Do we have other announcements for today? Or we're still in the ushers for March and April. Ushers for March and April. So if you are available to do that, um, please sign up out on the bulletin board. And someone told me there might be a birthday this week. He's not here. Uh, oh, and another one too. All right, so John has one and Carrie has one. Oh, oh, you took the day off. Is this his birthday? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we will sing out loud happy birthday to John, and uh, you can just silently wish Carrie a happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear John. Happy birthday to you. All right. Is that what we got this week? All right. So I'll invite you to stand and turn to the confession and forgiveness. 
Blessed be Holy Trinity, one God who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son, born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. Our opening hymn, hymn is All Creatures of Our God and King. You'll find that in your green hymnal. 527. 527. <coughs> Thank you. 
Daryl was here today and he opened up that new and saw that there was that many verses, he would have just walked out the door and went back home anyway. So, <laughs> The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let's pray together the prayer of the day. O oh Lord Jesus, make us instruments of your peace, that where there is hatred, we may sow love, where there is injury, pardon, and where there is despair, hope. Grant, O oh Divine Master, that we may seek to console, to understand, and to love in your name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we uh, listen to the word. Henny is going to read Genesis for us, and then maybe somebody else, like her grandma, is going to read the rest of the stuff. All right. You ready? You're on. You got a light. All right. First reading, Genesis 43, 3 through 11. A reading from Genesis. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So, dismayed where they they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourself. Because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve, preserve life for the faith. There has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which. Preserve for you to remain on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and to rule it over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. Your birds and all that you have, I will provide for you there since there are five more years of to come so that you and your household and all tall you have will not come to prevent and be poverty and your and your and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them and after them his brothers talked with him. 
the the Lord of the the Word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank you. We will read Psalm 37 together. Do not be provoked by evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. For they shall soon wither like the grass, and like the green grass fade away. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and find safe pasture. Take your life to the Lord, who shall give you your heart's desire. Commit your way to the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord and see what God will do. The Lord will make your vindication as clear as the light, and the justice of your case like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Do not be provoked by the one who prospers, the one who succeeds in evil schemes. Refrain from anger. Leave rage alone. Do not be provoked. It leads only to evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord shall possess the land. In a little while, the wicked shall be no more. Even if you search out their place, they will not be there. But the lowly shall possess the land. They will delight in abundance of peace. You, O oh Lord, will help them and rescue them. You will rescue them from the wicked and deliver them because in you they seek refuge. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians. But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? For what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a, bra- but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he ch- has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been, have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. The word of the Lord. All right, I'm going to invite the kids up for a little bit. You guys come on up. i got to get a couple things ready here. Have a seat. Good to see you. Hello. All right. Got to change a little thing up here. <coughs> Anticipation. Can't wait. All right. It came untied. All right. So, what does it look like when I have my my cape on? Like I'm a queen. Yeah. No, you're not buying it? Um, I have a crown. And then a crown, right? So, 
So queens, they have a big throne, like my lavish throne that I get to sit in, right? And they have a staff. Yeah. And the crown. So, I have to find my notes. Don't forget the necklace. All right. Okay. So, so, like kings and queens, princes and princesses, they are rulers, right? And, and what do rulers do? Rulers, they do help measure things. Um, yes. <laughs> this is a different kind of ruler. This is a ruler that's like a king or a queen, somebody in government. Oh, this is so not for a man. Here you go. Oh, if you are going to be the queen, get a crown that fits. Okay. So, rulers, kings and queens, they make rules, right? So I need you guys to help me make some rules, okay? Yeah, home ruler? All right, so if you're going to help me make rules, um, you're probably going to need a crown. So, you're, you all need one of these. All right, so you need to think about the rule. You all get to make one rule. If you were the, if you were the ruler for the day, what one rule would you make? Okay, all right? So, okay. Anybody ready? Got a rule? You have a rule? Okay, then you can come sit in the chair with your crown, and you can hold the scepter, and you can tell us what your one rule is as the as the princess. Okay, ready? Come on up, Ariana. Tell us your rule. There you go. What's your rule? You don't really know what a rule is. So you have rules, things that you that you do like. Like, don't run at the swimming pool is a rule. Rules like, um, yeah, stop at the stop sign. Things like that are rules. You want to think a little bit longer? Let's see if we got somebody else who's got a rule. Who's got a rule? You got a rule, come. All right. Nobody gives you rules? What are some rules that people think of? Right? Sometimes kings and queens make rules like um, everybody has to bow down when I walk by, right? But then there are the rulers, so they have to make rules about how people live together. So one of the rules that rulers make is um, don't kill each other, right? That's a rule everywhere. It's a pretty good rule. It's a pretty good rule, right? Yeah. I think, I think that's a... a a handy rule to have. You have one? Alright, come on now. Come up. Kenny's going to be our ruler. Don't cuss at each other. It's a very good rule. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have a rule? Don't run on the street. Don't run on the street. Okay. Alright, anyone else going to take a shot at rules? Okay. Don't fight with each other. There we go. All right. Okay. So, you guys did a good job as rulers. Okay? So, as Christians, um, our ruler is Jesus. We call Jesus our king, right? And Jesus gives us some rules to follow. And we're going to hear a story in a little bit. Um, and Jesus is going to give us something called the golden rule. Does anybody know what the golden rule is? Have you heard of that before? You've heard of it? Yeah. Lots of people have heard of it. Sometimes we don't remember it. Yeah. It's long. Is it long? So Jesus gives us a golden rule, and the rule is that we love one another. Right? So Jesus is going to tell us to love one another, 
And he's going to say um, that we even have to love people that we don't get along with. Now the rule is don't be greedy, yep. Yeah. So Jesus' major rule is to love one another, right? So we would treat people the way we want to be treated. How does that look? Right? If somebody um, is new at our school, should we welcome them? Right? Because if you're new at school, you want everybody to be nice to you, right? And make friends with you. Right? And so, um, if we don't cuss at each other, right, that's a good rule for how to be nice and how to be kind to one another. So those are good rules. Okay? But the main rule that Jesus tells us is love one another. Love other people. All right? Let's pray. Dear God, we want to treat others with love as Jesus taught us to do. Help us to do that as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. So I learn new things every day. I learned that glitter glue doesn't dry on styrofoam like ever. And while I kind of get resituated, I'm going to invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. It's just going to come to us out of Luke. The whole gospel according to Luke. And Jesus said, when I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend from those to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will be not, not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. you may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am the youngest of six children. And if you ask my siblings, they'll probably tell you that I was spoiled. I certainly had more opportunities than they did. There were five of them in a ten-year span when my parents were just starting out. For me, from sixth grade until I graduated from high school, I was the only kid in the house. I never knew what. My closet and drawers were full of clothes. I could fritter away my babysitting money away on books and cassette tapes. I went to multiple camps during the summer. And if I asked my dad for anything, he usually bought it for me. Also, I was probably a bit pretentious. Chatty and outgoing, I did not lack for self-confidence. 
And while my siblings may have found me annoying and tried to ditch me when they were hanging out with friends or cousins, I'm fairly certain, they might correct me if I'm wrong, but they never plotted my death. Joseph, however, was not quite so lucky. Joseph had ten older brothers, and they all thought he was spoiled. It was fairly plain to see. Their dad, Jacob, lavished Joseph with fancy clothes, which most of us have believed to be a marvelous coat of many colors, even though modern translators tell us the coat with long sleeves would probably be more accurate. But either way, it was markedly better and presumably far more expensive than anything Jacob had ever given to those older brothers. Plus, Joseph was really pretentious. Granted, he had a God-given gift for dream interpretation, but Joseph would tell his brothers how the dreams meant he was going to be a big, important somebody, and they would never amount to much of anything. Not to mention that Joseph had a different mom than his older brothers. Remember how Jacob fell in love at first sight when he saw Rachel at the well and asked for her hand in marriage, and then Rachel's dad tricked Jacob into marrying his older daughter Leah instead? So Joseph and his younger brother Benjamin were the children of Rachel, the woman whom Jacob truly loved and who died in childbirth with Benjamin, and Leah was the mom to the older brother. So there are a lot of complicated family dynamics at play in this story of Joseph and his family that ultimately result in Joseph's brothers planning to kill him. First, they leave him in a pit to die, but decide instead to sell him into slavery and tell their dad that he was tragically killed by a wild beast. Time passes. Joseph ends up in prison in Egypt where his ability to interpret dreams becomes known. The pharaoh, who is having some troubling dreams, hears about Joseph's talents. One thing leads to another, and Joseph ends up working for the pharaoh. Eventually, Joseph becomes the governor because he made predictions from the pharaoh's dreams about a coming famine, and the nation was able to plan ahead and stockpile resources. Other nations weren't so fortunate. The famine was severe, and people were starving. Jacob hears of prosperity in Egypt and sends his sons to get food. Lo and behold, who is in charge of everything? Their little brother, Joe. They don't recognize him. Many, many years have passed, and seriously, they never expected to see him again. They sold him into slavery, hoping he'd have a miserable life, not this not be this super successful governor. Yet, here he is. And Joseph has all of the power. Joseph literally now has their lives in his hands. So what does he do? Send them away empty-handed to starve? Throw them in prison? Sell them into slavery? Order them killed for their awful treatment of him? No. Joseph forgives them. Notice Joseph doesn't forgive and forget. Clearly, Joseph remembers how his brothers treated him. The Bible never tells us that as humans, we should erase the past from our minds. Joseph doesn't say that what they did to him was okay. In fact, he says that what they did was flat-out evil. But in forgiving, Joseph refuses to let the past control him, or his brothers for that matter. Forgiveness provides a way forward and helps to heal that broken relationship. In this moment, Joseph exemplifies a benevolent ruler one who is concerned about the needs of others. 
One who sees God at work in the midst of the situation. Because sometimes human rulers get it right. We heard the kids tell us the number one rule they might implement if they were in charge. As is true for most human rules, sometimes those ideas are about what's good for the king or the queen. Sometimes they're about what we think aren't very important things. And sometimes they are good for all of the people. And sometimes those rules, the ones that might be the best for all of the people, make us really uncomfortable. Take what Jesus has to say in Luke 6, for example. As Christians, we've heard this thing we refer to as the golden rule before. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us to do to others as we would have them do to you. As you would have them do to you. On the final night of his life on earth, Jesus says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And when asked about the greatest commandment, Jesus responds, Number one, love God. Number two, love people. It's familiar stuff. Yes, Jesus, we know. We are to love one another. But here in this story today, Jesus kicks it up a notch. And that's when we start to squirm. Because the instructions he gives for his followers are hard. Jesus is demanding. He has this crazy notion that his followers should serve others rather than themselves. He expects them to show integrity when no one is looking. He expects them to love. And not just those people that we like and who like us back in return. Not just people who only occasionally have a bad day. But enemies. Jesus expects you to love your enemies. So don't follow him unless you're ready to experience some discomfort. But Jesus invites us into something exciting, something radically different. Jesus calls us to another way of life, the way of love, unconditional love, giving generously to others without expecting anything back, without judging them by their appearance or their situation, without any secret motives or hidden agenda. Jesus invites us into a life where what has power and control over us is not our past with its failures and its hurts, the animosity or the grudges that we hold against others. Instead, Jesus invites us into a life where what has power and control over us is love, which isn't some mushy, misty-eyed, sappy emotion. Much like the great love chapter in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, this love that Jesus speaks of is much less a feeling than it is an action. Notice all of the verbs that Jesus uses here. Love, do, do good, bless, pray, give. Which indicates that the action of loving is a choice. And that's how the kingdom of God will be experienced here on earth, through Jesus' followers who do outlandish things, things that defy the powers of the world. Jesus invites us to live into our God-given identity and deal with others in the same way that God deals with us, mercifully, graciously, generously, lovingly. You are beloved children of God. You are invited into the kingdom where Jesus, the benevolent ruler, reigns. And his number one rule is this. Love.
I invite you to stand for our hymn of the day, Light Dawns on Weary World. The words are printed in your bulletin. During the season of Epiphany, we remember that Jesus is indeed the light that the darkness cannot overcome. Receive mercy. God of grace. Hear our prayers. 
Nurture feels that lie dormant, resting until it is time to bloom again. Bless farmers and all who cultivate fields and urban gardens. Give favorable weather for planting, bring forth from buried seed an abundant harvest, and guard against famine and disease. God of grace, look upon our world with mercy, that we delight in an abundance of peace. Protect all whose lives are marred by war and civil unrest. Maintain peace between Russia and the Ukraine. Release political prisoners and amplify the voices that challenge us to seek forgiveness and pursue nonviolence. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your people cry out for mercy. Console hearts that long for forgiveness, mend broken relationships. Heal bodies that suffer chronic pain or illness. For those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, especially Scott Evans, Larry Hillrood, and the others on our prayer list. Strengthen and deliver all whose spirits are troubled. God of grace, hear our prayer. You bind us together into one family. Teach us to forgive one another and to resolve conflicts with humility and patience. Bless families of all shapes and sizes, and show love to those who are lonely or grieving. God of grace, we praise you for the saints who have inherited the fullness of your kingdom. As you've raised them to imperishable and eternal life, sustain us in faith by the promise of resurrection. God of grace, since we have such great hope in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another as you're comfortable. moment to be reminded of all that God gives to us, God's abundant grace and mercy and provision. And we respond back with our time and our talents and our treasures to continue God's mission in and for the world. And so we pray. Holy God, the earth is yours and everything in it, yet you've chosen to dwell among your creatures. Come among us now in these gifts of bread and wine, and strengthen us to be your body for the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. During this season of Epiphany, we've been learning a new communion song. Um, in this piece of love, the words are printed in your bulletin.
and dine. The banquet of the Lord awaits all who hunger and thirst. We'll receive our elements from the center aisle. In the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let's pray together the prayer after communion. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all. Strengthened with the richness of your grace. In your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to stand. God who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. Amen. Our sending song is um, to a familiar tune. Um, it's called Build a Longer Table, and it comes from the new supplemental hymnal, All Creation Saints.
Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.